So today, the City of Brooklyn Center is announcing its new citation and summons policy, which is going into effect. This new policy requires police officers to issue citations for misdemeanors and gross misdemeanors, offenses, and then release the person unless law, the law requires that person to be held. Offenses, excuse me, officers are required to utilize alternatives to arrests and custody uh, to de-escalate situations. The policy does not apply to felony offenses and allows a person to be held in limited situations when required to protect against immediate threat to the public. This policy, which is our first step of the Dante Wright and Kobe Demick Hasler Community and Safety and Violence Prevention Resolution uh, to be enacted since it was passed in May, was facilitated by myself, the mayor, the city manager, Dr. Reggie Edwards, and our police chief, and our city attorney. So today we're taking another step forward in our collective work to reimagine public safety in Brooklyn Center. I'm gonna now call on our city attorney, Troy Gilchrist, who will uh, walk us through the uh, uh, citation and summons policy. All right, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. As the mayor indicated, the um, policy that the city uh, has adopted through the city manager's office is, uh, is a product of, uh, first of all, the direction from city council uh, through its Public Safety Act, the resolution uh, that uh, it enacted, as the mayor indicated, uh, trying to bring about uh, changes in law enforcement. Uh, this is one piece of that. We worked with several groups uh, to put this together, including the city attorney, um, the prosecuting attorney for the city. And so uh, talking about, this is just a brief uh, summary of uh, the resolution. Uh, it focuses on citation and release instead of taking people into custody. The approaches discussed in the policy certainly aren't new to law enforcement. But the importance is the policy imposes uniform limits on discretionary arrests and requires the use of alternatives to avoid taking people into custody. It's important to note that policy is limited to misdemeanor and gross misdemeanor offenses when arrest is not required by law. I know that was one of the concerns uh, and this policy makes it uh, abundantly clear that if the law requires arrest or booking, then that is uh, still to occur. But when arrest is not mandated, the policy requires police to issue a citation and allow a person to leave. The policy does recognize that in limited circumstances, arrest may be required in order to protect the person, property, or public safety. In such, circumstance, in, excuse me, in such circumstances, the police are required to attempt alternatives to de-escalate the situation to avoid having to take the person into custody. Another important aspect of this policy is that it requires officers to keep records specifically identifying the reasons why a person was not issued a citation and released. It also requires the officer to describe which alternatives to arrest were attempted before taking a person into custody. This information will aid the city in its efforts to collect arrest data to ensure the city council's policy direction to use alternatives to arrest and custody are being implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. So, so as uh, as Mr. Gilchrist said, you know, this is part of our uh, efforts at uh, reforming our public safety here in Brooklyn Center. We think that it's an important milestone. But we know that. Uh, there, there are uh, a significant number of people who are imprisoned, uh, who uh, often cannot make bail simply because of financial circumstances where other people who, are, who have the financial means are able to uh, make bail and be released uh, from prison, um, from, from jail. And this, this uh, step uh, moves us closer to ensuring that there's more equity 
in, in how uh, we conduct public safety. Uh, of course, if anyone is posing an actual threat to the public safety, they will be arrested. Uh, one of the, the, uh, the pieces to implementing public safety reform that's going to actually uh, keep the community safe and that uh, centers the voices of the community uh, whom we're aiming to keep safe is engaging with the community and engaging with community uh, organizations that uh, do this work that are in touch with, uh, 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 with, with, especially with affected communities. And so one of the representatives that we have uh, that I'll call on to, to speak next is uh, Mr. Brian Pullman. He represents uh, BBCC, the uh, Black Barbershop uh, and Church Cooperative. Mr. Pullman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so as the Mayor just introduced me again, my name is Brian Pullman, lead organizer with BBCC of Isaiah Faith in Minnesota. Uh, I think before we even uh, continue, I have to mention my colleague who did a lot of the work too uh, with me on the grounds in Brooklyn Center as we engage the community. His name is John LaFontaine, organizer for the Brooklyns, uh, affectionately Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center, uh, who we did steady, uh, consistent engaging of the community because we understood that in this process we have to prioritize the community every step of the way. This kind of intention speaks loud when you're talking about co-governance. The reason why we're so passionate about co-governance is that when you're talking about communities of people who do not understand the power of their voice collectively, these are the kind of steps that ensure and validate our efforts and missions as we organize in Brooklyn Center. When you have a step like this that's practical and we're no longer talking about theoretic theoretically, then we have to actually celebrate and commend the leadership of Brooklyn Center the city council members, the mayor, the prosecution team, the police, all involved to make sure that we can have a community where they are prioritized. The second point that I wanna make is that it opens up a conversation. How, can, how do we define public safety? It sparks the political imagination of the residents of Brooklyn Center. So I'm more than excited about making sure we have this kind of citation and summons policy in place. It ignites the community, it sparks the interest of the community, and it encourages them to continue using their voices every step of the way. And the one thing I know about involving and prioritizing the community is if you continuously involve them, then you can't go wrong. We have a right to define what public safety is, we have a right to define it in every step there is, and we also have the right to make sure that the community is there every step of the way. So I'm energized about this. Uh, I think this is, I think Brooklyn Center is gonna set the tone uh, for the rest of the state and every other city about what real co-governance looks like, what it looks like to start getting things done. And more importantly, it preserves the dignity and the respect of every single resident of Brooklyn Center. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Fullman. All right, uh, next I'll call on um, one of uh, the other organizations that has engaged Brooklyn Center in the process of uh, public safety reform and uh, in, in working with us closely to ensure that uh, what we're doing uh, doesn't run afoul of people's uh, civil liberties. Uh, uh, Monera Mohammed from the ACLU of Minnesota. Thank you, Mayor Mike Elliott. So I'm just gonna give a short prepared statement. Um, hello, my name is Munir Mohammed, ACLU Policy Associate. Um, and we've had the wonderful pleasure of working with the Mayor and City Council to provide policy guidance on the Community Safety and Violence Prevention Resolution. We believe strongly that these policies laid out in the resolution have the potential to transform community safety at Brooklyn Center. It's important to realize that this is just step one in realizing a very ambitious resolution that lays out other important provisions, such as establishing the mental health crisis teams, exploring options for civilian traffic enforcement, and a new streamlined public safety department that could look at problems through a public health and community first approach. In the effort of building safer communities, lowering the temperature of interactions between the armed police officers and residents reduces the chances for escalation in violence. 
This indicates a city willing to learn from past mistakes and a committed to moving forward with evidence-based and meaningful policies. The Zion Summons policy is clearly not a catch-all solution, but rather the beginning of a long road where Brooklyn Center residents and City Council work hand-in-hand -hand to create a more just public safety system that protects everyone's civil liberties and rights. Thank you. Right, thank you, Manera. Thank you. So now I believe we have time for just one question. So who is it going to be? One question? Just kidding. <laughs> Um, I wondered if you could uh, talk a little bit about funding and how all of this is being paid for. I think I talked to some residents who are concerned about how this will be funded, um, the entire, I guess, process. And then I also wondered if you could respond to concerns in the community that about a quarter of officers in Brooklyn Center have left the department since April. <laughs> Certainly. Well, um, you know, what, what we're doing here, the work that we're doing is uh, reimagining our public safety system, uh, reimagining what public safety looks like, what it feels like, uh, to ensure that every member of our community feels safe. And <clears throat> undoubtedly, this is going to require us to examine our budget and to ensure that it's aligned with the values and the infrastructure as we, as a community, have outlined together in our public safety resolution. For context, our city currently spends about 43% of its budget on policing. And one of the first jobs of the implementation committee uh, will likely be looking at this budget line, uh, taking into account the city's general funds and existing uh, uh, outlays, as well as exploring available external uh, funding opportunities, such as uh, you know federal funds or state funds or uh, foundational grants that that are available to us. Already, we have uh, received um, funding from foundations to help us implement the resolution. But of course, it's, it's going to take us reevaluating you know, how we're currently uh, spending our money and make sure that it is in alignment with the new vision that we're setting forward for uh, what it means to keep our community safe. So you don't, just to be clear, you don't have a dollar figure or an idea of when you would know kind of what this massive overhaul would cost? Because I know that in the past you've said your goal is to have this all completed by uh, the one year anniversary of when Dante Wright was killed. Do you, do you have a number in mind and then do you think April is still a feasible timeline? Well, April is certainly an, an aspirational uh, timeline to get this work done. I do believe that we can uh, get the, the framework in place by that time and even get uh, some of our programs operational. Um, in some ways, the timeline really is driven by our need to ensure that there isn't another uh, fatality. Uh, you know, like, like we saw with uh, Kobe Demick Hasler or with uh, Dante Wright. In, in so many ways, that's, that's really what's driving the timeline. We know that on average it's about 18 months. Uh, so. We all care deeply about the safety of our community, so we need to implement these changes uh, expeditiously. And you've got to know how much it costs, right, to, to be able to. So to, just, I just want to be clear for folks, do you know kind of what the cost for all this would be, where it would come from, or is that more of the job of the implementation committee? Yeah, that is more, that is more the job of the implementation committee, is to really assess uh, what this is going to cost and uh, assign dollar figures to it and uh, uh, help make sure that we're um, you know, going through our budget and apportioning dollars in ways that are going to be in alignment with, with uh, our morals, our values, and uh, what, what our community has decided is 
uh, a new North Star forward, and that is, you know, this this uh, safety resolution that's really going to help make sure that we have more tools in our toolbox, right? We have uh, alternative responses so that 911 doesn't just always lead to a police officer coming to your house when maybe a better response, uh, as studies have shown and other communities have shown, a better response, it's more appropriate, right? Uh, if your family is going through and experiencing a mental health crisis, uh, you want someone with a mental health background and expertise uh, to show up. Uh, if you know there's another situation that doesn't necessarily involve crime or, or violence, um, where you ordinarily would need a police officer, uh, you know, in those situations you might need a police officer, but in other situations you just need a different response that can you know ensure that situations are. Um, addressed uh, and that the community is kept safe. And then just the second part of the question, who can respond to the, the departure of a significant part of the staff of officers that the city didn't have? Well, uh, what I will say is departments all across the country are experiencing uh, officers leaving. It's happening in virtually every city in, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, we're 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 not unique in that in that regard. Uh, a neighboring city just over, I, I understand. Um, you know, they they lost ten officers as well through combination of retirement or uh, you know officers transferring and going to uh, different departments. Have you and, talked with or communicated with the officers who left Brooklyn Center about maybe what those are attributed to or? Because I think that for a quarter of the police force on an already small police force, it's significant, and some residents have told me they feel less safe because of that. You know, according to uh, information provided by our, by our police chief, I think we were earlier in the beginning of this year at maybe 44 officers. And I think we're at 40, I'm sorry, we're at 30, 38 or so now. Um, so, I was told 12 left from the city. That was from the, when I put in a data request, so that's where I got that number. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, we began the year with 44, and we're at about 38 officers. So, then some have been, you hired more, or is that a priority to hire more officers or fill those positions? Certainly have, uh, I think, hired maybe two officers or so uh, recently. Um, yeah, I, I think we're we're not different than any other departments uh, in in the metro that are experiencing you know officers. A lot of officers have retired, and uh, again, others are transferring to other departments. And you don't think the city is less safe because of that drop in numbers? Because perhaps in the grand scheme of things, we feel that, that you didn't need that many officers to begin with because those resources could be dispersed in different ways. Well, I, I certainly don't feel unsafe in my city you know i i feel very safe and i think you know generally the people of brooklyn center feel that this is a safe and healthy community uh you know and um and we're going to continue to work you know to make sure that it, it continues to be a safe place and uh and that we're improving safety okay thank you so I'm getting go ahead I was going to say, getting back to uh, today's news, uh, the recitation policy that goes in effect today. Yes. Yeah, the citation and summons policy is in effect. Okay, and just to be clear, that means if I were stopped for a minor traffic violation, I could be given a ticket, but I could not be taken in to jail. I would be free to go on my way. Do I understand that right? Troy, you want to come up? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, so just in terms of the interpretation of the cit citation and summons policy from a legal perspective, uh, Troy can answer that question. Um, Thank you. I mean, generally speaking, yes, that's true. Now, if you had a warrant for your arrest, those sorts of things, then yes, you'd be arrested. But, but uh, it's just an average, you know, I ran a stop sign by mistake or I had expired tabs or broken headlight or didn't made it wrong lane change, you would still give me a ticket, but I would still be able to go on my way, is that right? Generally speaking, yes, yeah. it, it's, it is a citation and, and release. Now, the, the policy I didn't mention, there's one sentence in the, in the policy that talks about 
uh, the department even ex exploring alternatives to issuing citations, uh, uh, suggesting alternatives to social programming and th those sorts of things that um, further try to avoid creating a criminal record uh, for someone. But yes, generally that, that is the case. Um, the exceptions that we talked about, there's a list of exceptions in there where arrest uh, is um, allowed uh, in, in, uh, in that realm of discretionary arrest. Uh, in situations where the officer believes, reasonably believes that there's threats to the person, to others, those are the, the uh, underlying um, offense involved firearms, dangerous weapons, those sorts of things. So there's still uh, obviously the, the public safety element to it that uh, gets protected through this as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you guys know, is Minnesota the first jurisdiction, or is uh, Brooklyn Center the first jurisdiction in Minnesota to implement this policy, or have others done it? I personally don't know in Minnesota. Yeah. Do you know? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if we're the first jurisdiction in Minnesota to implement this policy or not. Okay. Um, and then the other question I have is, if the policy goes into effect today, how much training have your officers gotten in order to implement it? So what types of things have been happening behind the scenes Possible so, that they're prepared. so you know we the the police chief has been involved in the process of developing this policy uh, so you know he has initiated the process of uh, communicating with his staff his officers to ensure that they are uh, brought up to speed on the policy and let me just say that um, it's my understanding that uh, the police department had uh, already started to, you know, in, in some regard, do some of these practices, uh, uh, you know, and so it, it isn't entirely, you know, uh, it isn't going to be entirely uh, new that we're asking them to engage uh, in, this, in this type of work. And then how much input have you gotten from the community? I know there have been community listening sessions and that type of thing, but do you have any estimate on it? And then on the flip side, we've heard from some law enforcement groups who have been critical of a lot of these changes. How involved were they in the overall planning? In initially, they had said, you know, they didn't have a seat at the table when it came to talking with you guys about the changes. Certainly, you know, I, I think that uh, some of that is fair. We um, designed this uh, policy, this resolution with uh, centering the voices of the community uh, because you know that is what we believe was needed to uh, create this new vision and this new North Star for how the community felt uh, it needed to transform its public uh, safety programs uh, to ensure that it felt safe and the, the, uh, the, the, the police chief and, and the leadership did have an opportunity though to provide comments to uh, to the resolution, and those comments were read uh, to the city council prior to the city council taking action and voting on the resolution. And then, did you have any estimate on um, how many people in the community actually weighed in? If I had to to estimate, it, it was I think I believe we had perhaps five listening sessions. We had a listening session at Brooklyn Center High School with just students. Uh, we had a listening session uh, with, uh, um, with the community at the Heritage Center uh, that probably had, I wanna say upwards of 60, maybe 70 people uh, from different backgrounds, you know. Uh, we also had a listening session in front of the police department where people had gathered to protest and we engaged the community that way through a combination of listening and healing. Uh, we had a virtual Zoom uh, listening session as well where people were able to join in. You know, so we, we really took it upon ourselves to ensure that uh, the community was the one driving uh, you know, this uh, this new North Star, this new way of looking at public safety. And we, we believe that that is the right way. 
And then just to follow up on the rest of the resolution, so the traffic enforcement division is not starting today. The unarmed no. division. No. Any update on where that stands and when that might come into play? Uh, yeah, so I have no information about that uh, part of the resolution today, but there'll be more uh, more to come on that. I will say that we are uh, also, as you probably know, hiring uh, to make sure that we're building capacity to implement the resolution. We're hiring, you know, through Fuse, two funded two Fuse funded pos uh, positions. One is a data. Uh, analyst position and another it's a community engagement position and uh, both of those positions are not coming out of the city pockets they're being funded by FUSE and but they're full-time executive level talents that are assigned uh, to us here to help us uh, do the work of implementing the resolution and uh, we're also hiring a project manager that's going to help coordinate the work of the uh, uh, implementation committee and that is also funded through the ERP dollars so that also isn't coming out of our city pockets so we're finding ways to make sure that we're uh, funding this work without or um, as little impact to taxpayers as we can is the uh, citation policy is this its final form or is this something that you know will be in effect say in six months we'll kind of look to see how is it working and maybe we need to make some tweaks or changes uh, can you talk a little bit about that the citation uh, and summons policy that we have now uh, will come before the implementation committee which of course is made up of Brooklyn Center residents and that committee uh, is going to review the citation and summons policy and make uh, any adjustments that are needed. Uh, as we're doing this work, we're mindful of the idea that uh, we're going to need to continue to evolve. And uh, as we collect data on new policies that we implement, we're gonna let that data guide any adjustments that need to be made to the policy. So the, the, the policy creates um, the general rule is uh, to issue the citation and, and release. So that is the general rule. As far as the exceptions that I mentioned in order to protect uh, public safety, uh, we work closely with the ACLU and frankly had a great number of discussions back and forth about how about this and how about that and, and trying to refine the language. So uh, there uh, really reduce the circumstances where there could be um, concerns that um, uh, we had a lot of discussions about you create a, uh, an exception that swallows the rule or the policy uh, and so we're very careful to try to craft that in, in such a way that where that didn't happen uh, so so really I, I do think uh, that this does create a situation where um, to the extent an officer does determine that one of the criteria applies where they do need to arrest they need to explain that in writing as part of the report. And, and the police department's talked about creating a, a portion of, of their form where this information is identified. Uh, so as part of that data collection piece, that can easily be reviewed and, and quantified as, as this goes forward and we gain experience. And to the mayor's earlier point, uh, yeah, this certainly is not a final policy. It recognizes right in the opening paragraph of, of the current policy that the implementation committee is going to take this on. Um, at least my hope is that they'll have opportunities to hear from the different groups that were talked about earlier, uh, folks that perhaps didn't have an opportunity to input into this policy at this point. That opportunity will be given, um, is my hope, during the implementation committee. And, and as the mayor indicated, uh, yes, changes will likely be made. Um, law enforcement is aware of this. You know, They really made a point when we had these discussions that you know, we do a lot of this right now. Uh, and so what the policy does, though, is create a, a, a set of formulaic, you will do this before you arrest, you will consider alternatives to arrest. And if you determine you need to arrest and the alternatives didn't work, you need to document why. So then we have a record of that. My name, uh, so Troy Gilchrist, G-I-L-C-H-R-I-S-T. I'm with Kennedy and Gravy. Okay. Thank you. Will they meet next to kind of review how things are going? 
The implementation committee has not met yet, has not been uh, formed. We do have applications available for people to fill out. Uh, they're interested in joining the implementation committee. That is available on the city website. But we anticipate that that committee will uh, be formed and 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 hopefully get going. You know, within the next uh, uh, one one to one and a half months. Uh, part of what we're doing is, of course, we're hiring folks that are going to come on and aid the work of the implementation committee. Uh, so we do need to have some some of that capacity in place before we can uh, get the implementation committee started. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Yeah.